Hi everyone, uh, my name is Professor Adams and I'm here to give a second um, Facebook Live uh, discussion of our FMT uh, study for autism. Um, so we did a previous one a couple weeks ago and this is going to be a new set of uh, questions and follow-up, hopefully answer um, almost all the questions that families have sent to us. Um, so just to begin with, um, a few things I wanna point out is uh, thanks to the many parent groups who are um, uh, advertising this Facebook Live and promoting it, and many thanks to the leaders who are helping get this out there. And also many thanks to the donors. We've had over 200 donors uh, donate over $40,000 to support our adult study, which we deeply appreciate. And uh, we are continuing that GoFundMe campaign. So if anyone would like to share uh, the GoFundMe campaign information, we'd appreciate that. If you'd like more information about what we're discussing today, you can go to our main autism website, autism.asu.edu. Uh, but also, if you want to see our, my personal recommendations, you can go to adamsautismresearch.com, and that has a lot more information specifically for autism families. So again, all the research that I'm gonna be talking about today has been done in close collaboration with uh, Dr. Rosie Krejmalnik brown and she'll be giving a Facebook Live uh, presentation in a few weeks from now. Um, so more on that later. Um, before I get into the Q&A though, I wanna mention a new study that was just uh, released uh, uh, yesterday uh, that we were uh, involved with. Uh, this is a very interesting study by, done by a good friend of ours at um, Caltech. Um, and he uh, investigated taking gut bacteria from children with autism and from typical children. So we used stool samples that we had collected here at ASU and then he injected those in a fecal transplant into mice. And when those mice had um, children, he was then able to see that the uh, mice who had been receiving the FMT from the typical children from our studies, those mice developed normally. But the mice who received a fecal transplant from the children with autism, those mice developed uh, significant autistic symptoms. This is very powerful because it demonstrates that the gut bacteria in children with autism are, are very toxic and that they by themselves seem to have the ability, at least in mice, to cause autistic symptoms by giving them to the mother and then the mother and then the infants develop autism after the infusion of those bad bacteria. Um, also, that study looked at a couple ways to try to ameliorate the effects, and um, they found that they could partially ameliorate the effects through two nutritional supplements that had some small benefits. So we want to look more in the treatments of that. What's also interesting is the more severe the children with autism were, the more severe the mice that received their gut bacteria were. So again, this strong connection just reinforces why we think gut bacteria are very important in autism and why we think it's very important to develop uh, treatments for it. Um, so with me is my uh, study coordinator, uh, Devin Coleman. So she's going to go through some of the questions. All right. Are there any supplements or treatments that would need, would need to be stopped in order to participate in the study? So for our research studies and for any research study, you generally want people to maintain all of the same treatments, diets, supplements, therapies, the same during a study. So that way we know that any changes we see are due to the study intervention and not due to anything else. The, one thing, the two things that we exclude are probiotics and, anti, and antibiotics because both of those can really um, change your gut flora. And so we don't want people to be using probiotics or antibiotics for a couple months prior to the study. But people interested in our studies can still apply and if they're on those, we can just wait until they get off. Do you have any plans to consider the impact of bacteriophage interplay? In our first study, we actually looked at bacteriophages, but unfortunately, the technology to measure bacteriophages, these are viruses that affect the bacteria in our gut. Unfortunately, the technology to measure those is orders of magnitude more expensive than to look at the gut bacteria themselves. So in our study, we were only able to look at a small number of bacteriophages and a small number of participants. 
And we did notice that there were some changes as a result of a microbiota transplant. So when we do a microbiota transplant, we're transferring not only the bacteria, but also the viruses that affect those bacteria, perhaps in good and perhaps in bad ways, depending on the viruses. We know we still have a lot to learn about bacteria in the gut. We have even more to learn about the viruses that affect the bacteria in our gut. So it's a big unknown and a big research topic, probably for many years to come. Do you believe that the observed improvements in the phase one trial were not only due to the transferred bacteria, but also to the mucus layer that was transferred from the donor into the host? Yeah. So in our study, we were giving a highly purified form of gut bacteria. It's 99% gut bacteria that we're transferring little, if any, of the biofilm or the mucus that these gut bacteria somewhat exist in. So in your gut, you have a biofilm and that is something that the bacteria or yeast form in order to protect themselves. And it can provide tremendous antibiotic and uh, antifungal resistance to those gut bacteria and yeast, so that even after you wipe them out with, say, a bowel cleanse, uh, remove most of the bacteria or yeast with a bowel cleanse, those living in that biofilm are still present and are still able to regrow. And that's why we chose to do a very long-term treatment, because we suspected that the bacteria in the biofilm would just reseed the gut. So that's why we continued to every day give a new dose of bacteria to overwhelm the contribution from what's lining of the gut. So to answer the question, we're really just giving the gut bacteria that are normally flowing in the stool. Um, and we think those are often generally the healthier ones. Uh, but Again, um, there might be a very small amount from the biofilm. Is there any way to regain lost strains of gut bacteria beyond this treatment method? No. So when you think about gut bacteria, we think that a person might have of order a thousand or so different species of gut bacteria. So there are different things that we can do to try to improve on those. You might initially think of using probiotics the limitation of probiotics is they only usually have about one to 10 strains in them. And again, we need about a thousand strains. And those strains and probiotics are typically the strains that are cultured in milk and generally not the types of strains that are growing in a healthy human gut. Uh, the strains in a healthy human gut are mostly anaerobic because your gut uh, has very little oxygen present, whereas the strains and probiotics are aerobic. Or bacteria that grow in air. So probiotics can be used. There are a few treatment studies for autism, very mixed treatment results on those, and these are open label studies, generally small, uh, generally, um, let's say there's still a lot of work to be done with those, but they do suggest that there may be some benefit. In particular, it was a study with a, a probiotic called Delp, um, perhaps a little bit more benefit with that probiotic. In general, if I was forced to think about a standard probiotic to use, I would prefer those with bifidobacteria because in our studies, we found it to be low in autism. And after microbiota treatment, we find it increases. And it's well known that these types of bacteria are beneficial. But I think by themselves, they're not nearly enough uh, for full benefit. Uh, other things to look at, um, you might think that prebiotics might be useful for autism. There's been only one study that, I, um, that came out just last year, and it was a very mixed study. It showed, suggested that prebiotics don't have much, if any, effect on gut symptoms, maybe a small effect, but they didn't show the data. They said it was just a trend, not significant. And oddly, it showed that if you were on a regular diet, the prebiotics tended to worsen your social uh, interactions with others. Whereas if you were on an exclusion diet, a gluten-free, casein-free diet, there was some benefit. So the results on prebiotics seem to be mixed. This is a very small study, but it suggests probably avoiding them if you're on a regular diet, possibly considering them. If you're on a gluten-free diet, it may have some small benefit. But we still have a lot to learn uh, about prebiotics. My favorite prebiotics really are just uh, whole fruits and whole vegetables. That's the sort of fiber that humans have been consuming for 
um, hundreds of thousands of years, and that what feeds our gut bacteria, and then those uh, the fiber in those help fruits and vegetables is then converted into butyrate, which is a very important food. It provides about 60%, 60 to 70% of the nutrition for the cells that line the gut. So I think a high fiber diet is also important, but my experience from talking with many families, both in and outside of our study, is that by itself, it's not enough to treat most GI problems. We think it's important in preventing them to begin with, but once you have a host of bad bacteria in your gut, it appears that a high fiber diet isn't enough uh, to help with that. Again, waiting for formal studies, but that's the impression I have from what I've learned. Our studies and other research groups have found that about a quarter of people with autism have increased the levels of yeast, and we, our data suggests that higher levels of yeast are associated with worse uh, autism symptoms, not worse GI symptoms, but worse autism symptoms. So I think a lot of people with autism have a hidden yeast infection causing neurological, but not gut symptoms for the most part. So I think everyone with autism probably should be tested for a yeast infection and then treated with an antifungal along with a low sugar diet. Unfortunately, these yeast infections, once you have them, seem to come back time and time again. It's very difficult to treat. Um, and to um, keep them gone, it seems that you need to have a low sugar, low carbohydrate diet for it to be successful. So those I think are some of the main things that you can do to try to improve your gut bacteria. There's a video comment that touched on something we saw a lot in the other comments in the last video, so I'm gonna ask it now. Uh, what are your opinions on the use of rifamixin? If I'm saying that right. Yeah, so that's an interesting antibiotic that's generally um, used for treating um, small, in, small intestine bowel overgrowth or SIBO. It's not something that we've had experience with in our research studies, and I haven't seen any research studies on it for autism. So I'm going to pass on commenting on it. I know it is being used by some physicians to treat SIBO, and that seems very reasonable. But um, because of the way the antibiotic works, it only works in the small intestine. It doesn't reach the large intestine. So I think it, its application is limited to small intestinal problems, whereas I think many of the GI problems all in autism also involve the large intestine. Are you seeing better improvements with the vancomycin group versus the non-vancomycin group? It's a great question. So in our child study, everyone received the vancomycin because we know it's a powerful antibiotic, very effective at treating clostridia. And there are several studies suggesting clostridia are some of the major culprits causing GI and autism problems. And a previous study had found that Vanco was very helpful in temporarily treating. But when the Vanco was stopped, those benefits were lost. Both GI and autism benefits were lost. So by itself, it's not enough. So that's why we use the Vanco to kill off the harmful bacteria and then we reseed with beneficial bacteria from healthy people. So the question is, helpful certainly in killing off harmful bacteria, probably kills off, it does kill off some beneficial bacteria as well. So in our adult study, we're asking the question, what if we didn't give Vanco? What if we didn't do that? Would we see as much benefit or not? And we don't know, but there was a study um, just, meant, just released from China where they uh, did microbiota transplant on 40-some um, uh, children with autism. I've only seen an abstract because it was presented at a conference, which is the abstract has been released. But it suggested that when they did a single dose of um, FMT by colonoscopy um, without Vanco, uh, at least they didn't mention Vanco, and then two months later, they did one more dose. They found a modest improvement in autism symptoms, maybe about 10%. It's not much more than placebo effect. And they also um, mentioned some modest benefit in GI symptoms. So the jury's out. We'll see what we find with our study. But um, it's a very interesting question if Vanco is helpful or not. We thought it was, and that's what we used in our first study. And it's, we believe it to be very safe because it's not absorbable. That's a great advantage to it. But the FDA has asked us to investigate not using it 
because there's always a risk whenever you use an antibiotic that you could develop antibiotic resistance, and Vanco is one of the major last resort antibiotics. So we don't want to overuse it. We only want to use it when it's necessary. Luckily, we seem to only need it to use it one time. How does one guarantee donor species composition? Do they taste test species of interest to guarantee its presence in the doses? It's a great question again. So we have so much to learn about what is optimal composition of gut bacteria. For something as simple as E. coli, we know that too little of it is bad and too much of it is bad. So it's in many cases not a question of do you have healthy or unhealthy bacteria, but it's a question of how much of that bacteria do you have? What's the right balance of all of these thousand species of bacteria, each digesting different types of foods, making many different types of metabolites, acting in different parts of the GI tract? It's incredibly complex. They have to be very cautious and say, we don't know. There are a lot of things we don't know. In general, we do know that higher diversity is associated with higher, um, with higher uh, degrees of gut health and fewer gut problems. So that's why we're so pleased in our study. See the children with autism started out with 25% lower level of diversity. And then after treatment, it normalized. And two years post-treatment, it was better than normal. We think because we used not one, but two healthy donors. So you get beneficial bacteria from each one. So the American Gastroenterological Association has a standard set of recommendations for how to screen for FMT donors for C. diff. And this basically is just like for the American Red Cross. So everything you'd screen for for a blood donor, check for any risk of infectious disease. In addition, they recommend checking for a wide range of GI problems in the individual and perhaps even in their family too, any family history of uh, GI cancers. Um, also checking to see that their normal body weight not obese, not underweight, but hopefully just right. That rules out a lot of people. Um, in addition, uh, checking to see that they are, um, even after they donate, we check on them a few weeks later to make sure that they're still healthy, that there have been no problems. There are a lot of things that we check on. There are also a large number of pathogens that we check for. And it's really an ongoing uh, interaction uh, and development that as we learn more, we'll learn to screen for more. But I want to emphasize that there is some risk that we thought that blood transfusions were very helpful to people and they have saved many lives. But my mother uh, died from a hepatitis C infection that she caught from a blood transfusion. My brother is hemophilia, nearly died from hepatitis C. The treatment almost killed him. And so we didn't know about hep C at the time. And we didn't know 30, 40 years ago about AIDS. So there are Diseases out there that we don't know about or new diseases that might develop. So we can only screen for so much. So there is some risk. And that's why, again, we think it's so important to be very, very careful with donor selection. Um, but one of the important things that we do is we make sure that when we give a don donation, when we give a dose of microbiota, it's from a single donor. That way, if there is a problem, we can track it back and it greatly decreases risk. Whereas in the blood uh, transfusion studies I mentioned, these were often because of, for hemophilia, you might need a donation from hundreds or a thousand people to get enough clotting factor. So you have a hundred to a thousand times greater risk when you pool donation. So that's why we're using single donor or an individual. And then later we switch to a second donor because then we believe that will increase the diversity where you get some healthy bacteria from one donor, some from another, and together we hope you get even more healthy bacteria from two. Um, but there is a little bit of extra increased risk by doing that. So that's why this is an investigational study that we do. That's why the FDA has classified a human stool as a, a drug that needs to go through um, FDA uh, regulations and investigations. Do you think this will work for kids that have a genetic disorder as well? That's a great question. Um, we certainly think if those children have underlying GI problems, it may help, but it's possible that the underlying genetic disorder may be causing those symptoms to begin with. So in our first study, we were excluding people who had 
uh, known single gene disorders like Fragile X because we know that the microbiome itself won't be able to change the genes of a person. We'll need gene therapy or other treatments for that. Um, so we think that we'll have a greater chance of success by treating people who don't have those single gene disorders. So at least initially, uh, we are restricting our studies to people who don't have known single gene disorders because we think we'll have a better chance of success. And our goal is to try to help not a few people, but to try to get this treatment approved for the million plus people with autism in the US and the many millions more around the world. So we want to try to target the people we think we have the best chance of treating first because that will also mean they have the best chance of benefit compared to the risk that they're taking. Are there any other universities or hospitals considering doing an FMT study? So currently, FMT is only allowed by the FDA for C. diff infections. It's not approved, so, uh, and that means it cannot be used off-label to treat any other condition, except as a research study like ours. So our group is the only group doing a research study. We have a close collaborator at university, excuse me, at um, uh, uh, Phoenix Children's Hospital right next door. So Dr. Richard Fry is hosting one site, we're hosting the other site. So he's doing that in a joint study with us. So anyone who applies to our study uh, will also be eligible for their site, for our adult study. Um, and so um, though our two sites are the only ones currently in the US doing these studies, and I don't know of any other sites in the US doing them. There are two other studies that I'm aware of around the world. The one I mentioned in China just released their somewhat positive results um, at a conference last week, and we're anxiously awaiting the full paper on that. And then I just heard today from a group in Hong Kong that is doing a study on children with autism, treating them with FMT. Um, but those seem to be the only studies currently going on for autism in the world. You have to travel to Arizona to be a part of the adult study? Yes, for both our child and adult studies, we do requ require people to travel to Arizona for the days of evaluation. So for the adult study, that involves three trips for about two days. So that way we do an evaluation of both um, autism symptoms on one day. It takes an, about an hour and a half or so. And then we also do an evaluation, then a physical exam with our physician just to check in the person's health, do those lovely blood draws that tell us actually so much about uh, safety and also looking for any potential risks that may be developing. Is there a risk of an immune response to FMTs, especially in a person who has not had the broad spectrum of bacteria since birth? Yeah, we don't know of any risk to doing FMT. In fact, probably the best example is the mouse study that was just released. The mouse study was done in mice that were germ-free. They'd been raised in a special sterile environment so that their guts were completely free of gut bacteria. And then they received either the uh, donation from the healthy human child, and then they developed normally, or they received the donation from the child with autism, and then they developed very abnormally uh, with autistic-like symptoms. So um, we aren't those studies didn't reveal any immunological problems. Our participants didn't reveal any immuno immunological problems. In fact, we've heard just the opposite. It seems that in some families, at least, they seem to no longer need uh, or be as rigorous about their exclusion diets, that the uh, individuals seem to be able to better digest the food that they're eating and eat a broader variety of foods. So, so far, we haven't seen any problems, but it's certainly something that we'd keep a close eye on is it's a close connection between the immune system and the GI tract. And the reason is very simple, that the foods you eat, the liquids you drink, uh, contain bacteria. That's the major way, in uh, one of the major ways, if not the major way in which bacteria are then exposed to the body, introduced to the body. And so that's why the immune system has such a major role in the gut to be a first line of defense against any new uh, bacteria or viruses that come in that way. Do you believe there's anything in the MTT material other than living bacteria that caused the reduction observed in autism symptoms? Great question. Um, again, through the
processing that my collaborators at University of Minnesota do, they're very, very careful. And so it's a highly purified form. So it's 99, over 99% gut bacteria. But there will be some small amount of bacterial phages in there. There'll be some small amounts of the metabolites that the bacteria uh, themselves are making. And I've seen some other studies that just, in some cases, just the metabolites from the bacteria can be enough in some cases to help. So, uh, but what we're giving is primarily uh, gut bacteria, 99%, and that seems to be the, the major factor. What GI problems are considered severe enough to qualify for your studies? So in our studies, we're looking at individuals who have what seem to be the most common types of GI problems in autism, which are primarily chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, or often alternating back and forth between the two. And when we say chronic diarrhea, it's usually not a full liquid diarrhea, but often just soft stools. So we have all the participants as part of the screening process do a 14-day stool diary. We'd recommend everyone uh, do this for their child with autism if they suggest any GI, suspect any GI problems. Because so many parents have told us when they start these diaries that they had no idea how bad their children's gut bacteria were because they haven't gone to look for years. Once a child's body trained, they don't go into the bathroom. They don't ask them in the morning at breakfast, so how was your poop today? That's just not a typical question to ask. So unfortunately, privacy issues are really limiting parents' knowledge of what's really going on with their child. And the child's not going to comment about it if they've had diarrhea for years. Why would they bring it up? They just think that's what they normally have. So, so many parents have told us it wasn't until they started doing a daily stool record every day, looking at their child's stool. And we use a simple Bristol stool scale. So on a scale of one to seven, one is it very hard, four is it just right, well-formed logs, or seven is it liquid. And that gives us a very good clue. Do they have constipation or diarrhea? Are they missing stool some days? Or we've seen some children might be having five or more stools a day. That's abnormal. What's normal typically is about one stool a day or even two to three stools a day, one for each meal. Um, so that would be pretty typical. Uh, if you're having stools less frequently than once a day, I'd be a little concerned. And the, we've seen cases of going once every seven days. Those are the really severe cases. Um, but on the other hand, we also are temporarily excluding people with very severe GI issues like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Because even though some studies suggest that um, these are treatable to some extent with microbiota transplant, in about 20% of the time, those people uh, have a temporary flare up of those severe GI conditions. These conditions are so severe, the pain it can be so severe that sometimes the only treatment is just to cut out that part of the gut. And, and that's tragic that it's that bad. They're causing bloody diarrhea, just horrible pain in these individuals. So we're, treat, we're excluding people who don't have G, obvious GI symptoms, and we're excluding people with really severe GI problems at the moment. We're actually talking about doing a, a study in future for people who have really severe GI issues. So we want to help those too. We want to help everyone with autism. Um, and that's just initially Long-term, we would like to do a study also with people who don't have obvious GI problems or to have low, gut, low diversity of gut bacteria because our studies have shown that people with autism, regardless of whether or not they have GI problems, generally have low diversity of gut bacteria. So we're starting with the treatments that we think have the highest chance of success, treating people with these moderate GI problems, chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, but then once we do those studies, we hope to move to both the more severe and the less severe cases. Can FMT help small intestinal bowel overgrowth, also known as SIBO? It's a great question. And the answer is, I don't think we know. I don't think anyone's done a study yet to see. But I'll point out that when we give, in our microbiota treatment study, we gave the bacteria orally, because that's a normal way in which your body gets exposed to gut bacteria. The bacteria in your gut are seeded by what comes down through your mouth, through your stomach, and makes it into your small intestine and then your large intestine. So um, because we're giving gut bacteria, 
that are passing through the small intestine and moving on to the large intestine. And because we're not seeing any problems with SIBO, um, but our patients didn't have any of that, any SIBO to begin with, um, we don't know if it would help. It might. Uh, it would be very interesting to see, but we just don't know. What do you suggest we do for our children to improve their bowel microbiome in the meantime? So I've already mentioned several things that can be done that I think um, uh, going eating a high fiber diet can help prevent GI problems, but doesn't seem so much to help with treating them. Probiotics seem probably the most promising, but mostly limited benefit, it seems. Um, the prebiotics, as I mentioned, seem mixed. We have just one small study, um, so it's unclear. My favorite, again, is just eating whole fruit, whole fruits and whole vegetables. So we did do a, a, another study, a comprehensive nutritional intervention study, where we combined six different nutritional treatments, including a vitamin mineral supplement we previously studied, previously demonstrated to be effective, a fish oil, because we know that's very important also, um, a very important nutrient. Um, also, we gave Epsom salt because many people with autism are low on sulfate, which is what is in Epsom salts, their magnesium sulfate. We also gave carnitine because many people with autism seem to benefit from carnitine supplements. We gave digestive enzymes uh, because several studies, several major studies have shown children with autism are often missing digestive enzymes for sh small sugars, especially the sugar in milk called lactose. Um, and then finally, we put them on a healthy diet, meaning lots of fruits and vegetables and protein and avoiding junk food. And um, that combination, and it was especially three, it was especially the vitamin mineral supplement, the fish oil, and the healthy diet that really seemed to make uh, the big difference. Um, that we saw many of the same types of improvements that we saw from the microbiota transplant therapy it's not to the same degree, maybe about half as much. We saw about a 30% reduction in GI symptoms as opposed to in the microbiota transplant, it was about 80%. So I think that these treatments, because they're available today, uh, we're very excited about. That's why we did a major study. We found also um, a, a seven point gain in nonverbal IQ from these treatments. There's more information about the study. We published it a year ago on our website. Um, the vitamin mineral supplement we've made available through a nonprofit we created. Uh, if you're interested, that nonprofit is um, www.autism, N for nutrition, R for research, C for center.org. I'm the president of that nonprofit. I don't get any salary or any royalties. I just formed it just to give people uh, access to the supplement we found to be very useful for autism. Um, also, we used a fish oil that's high in, ome in omega-3s, especially high in EPA. Um, and uh, the problem, we think, with most fish oil studies is people are just dosing too low. So we were dosing in much higher level. So we now have on the ANRC website a protocol we've created, and that has more detailed recommendations on how to implement the treatments that I just mentioned. So if you want to, you can go there for more info. What do you think about do-it-yourself MTG? I have to be very cautious here because the FDA has said that um, microbiota transplant and only physicians can only do that for people with a proven C. diff infection, proven by a test for the C. diff toxin. And it's, they cannot, they're not legally allowed to do it for people with autism. They could lose their license. So that's a problem. Uh, 10 years ago, you could do it, but you aren't allowed to do it now because of the new FDA regulations. So um, we, as I've tried to explain, this is an investigational treatment. We think it's very promising. The FDA just awarded us with fast track status, meaning that they agree that it's a promising treatment, not proven, but promising, and for an unmet need for treating core symptoms in autism, for treating GI problems, for which there are no treatments uh, today. There are no FDA approved treatments for the core symptoms in autism. And so we think it's a very promising treatment, but there are some potential risks. Luckily, our studies have so far, so far shown it to be very safe. 
but again, we can't rule out that there's some risk. So that's why we're doing the research studies to try to eventually get it approved um, through by the FDA so it can be available to everyone. But again, uh, there's some caution there and some concern. So we cannot, we do not recommend people do it yourself. Um, uh, again, we're just pointing out um, what we've done in our studies. So that was the end of our official questions, but there's been some questions coming up on the live feed. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of those? Go right ahead. Okay. Can the product be modified for young children who cannot swallow um, capsules? That's a great question. So with our first study, we used a liquid form. And that liquid form, when we gave it to children, they drank it down. Uh, the problem was we also had to give them a stomach acid suppressant because your stomach acid kills um, over 99% of the gut bacteria that you're exposed to. So to put this in perspective, your stomach may have a few hundred bacteria in it. Your small intestine will have millions to billions of gut bacteria in it. So your stomach acid kills off almost everything. It's a very good line of defense for you against eating foods that have bacteria on them. So that's why I used a stomach acid suppressant for people taking it in the liquid form. And that worked very well. Um, but we have some concerns about that. So now in our adult study, we're using a special pill form that's enteric coated. Well, not exactly enteric coated. I can't reveal the details of it. That's a little proprietary to my colleagues. Um, but it's a special form so that it survives the stomach acid and opens up in the small intestine. And so um, we think that's a better approach in general. We know some people uh, don't swallow pills easily, so that's why we have a pill swallowing video on our website to help people. It's a great video from the University of Calgary. We would like to also have a small capsule form or even a liquid form. The problem is every time we use a different form, if we use a small pill versus a large pill, to the FDA, that's a new drug. We have to do a new set of phase one, phase two, phase three studies, and that's another $100 million or more potentially to get it approved by the FDA. So it's very, very difficult for us to use more than one form. So we're sticking with the form initially that we think is most effective, and that's the form that is a um, form for a uh, pill form. Now, at some day in the future, I'd love to do a study for very young children. We think that we have the most chance to have the most benefit, perhaps, with young children. And so for them, we'd probably go back to using a liquid form and live with a stomach acid suppressant. But that's a ways down the road. Again, the FDA is cautious, and they've been, we've been very lucky to be able to do a child study um, for initially children as young as seven. We hope our next study will be for even somewhat younger children. But again, we are limited by uh, FDA requirements. Do you check the stool of the patient's feces for evidence of engraftment? Does their stool reflect, reflect the donor's bacterial composition after FMT? It's a great question. So the answer is yes. We check very carefully. Um, engraftment is a tricky thing to look at because we're looking at a thousand different species of bacteria. What we can say is that after FMT, the recipient, the child with autism, their gut bacteria becomes more similar to that of their initial donor. Then, eight weeks later, the gut bacteria is more similar to that of their second donor. That suggests to us then that that second um, donor, that maintenance dose, even though it's a much lower dose, is also very important. What's really interesting then is that two years later, the children have very different gut bacteria. They're very different from their donors. And that's really not too surprising because they're eating different foods. It's been two years. What's great is they have an even higher diversity than their donors did. We think because they received donors, not one, but two donors. So we think that's very, very uh, interesting. And it just means that they've developed their own microbiome that matches their own dietary intake. Now in our studies, we had to require that they not change their diets. A few of our participants were on healthy diets. 
Some of them were on the same terrible diets that many kids with autism and many typical kids are on. And that they all, it didn't seem to make a large difference. They still generally did well. Um, but in future, of course, we'd recommend going with a higher fiber, healthier diet. We just think that's going to help maintain a good microbiome long term. How do you feel about proteobacteria being higher than 4% in the donor? Offhand, I don't remember um, the specific amount of any one bacteria, but what I would say in general, and I'm, this would be a great question to ask my um, colleague, Rosie crouch malnick brown who's really our microbiome expert. The bacteria that I'm most interested in are the Prevotella, because we know that in healthy um, African children on traditional high-fiber diets, 50% of their gut bacteria is Prevotella. Whereas in Western Europeans, it's less than one-tenth of 1%. And in children with autism, it's, an, it's even 10 times lower than that, essentially non-detectable. But after treatment, it goes way up. And it anti-correlates with a number of pathogenic bacteria. And so, um, there, and it's also associated with people who, have, who exercise regularly have much more Prevotella. So we think Prevotella, very, very promising. Uh, very interesting to look at. We'd love to do a, a development of a new probiotic based on Prevotella, but again, that's classified as a new drug and requires a huge investment to create a new probiotic. Can children from outside the U.S. take part in your studies? Currently, we're limiting our studies to children in the U.S., and the reason is that our donors are from the U.S., and so we want to have people who are eating uh, the sort of diets that are typical for them. So someone from another country who might be eating very different foods, uh, their gut bacteria in a healthy person from that culture is going to be somewhat different. So that's part of the reason why we want to uh, restrict our studies initially to people in the U.S. Also, part of the reason is that when we're comparing against typical gut bacteria, we want to look at what's typical for people here in the U.S. So that's what we collected our samples from. Now in a phase three study, uh, if we get to that, and I sure hope we will, and we're trying hard to get there, then we might be doing 10 or 20 sites, and it's very common to do some of those sites in other countries as well. And so Canada, other countries would be great places to look at as well. What's an approximate time frame for getting MPT FDA approved? <laughs> That's a great question. It really depends very much on, on our funding. So we have, we did a phase one study demonstrating safety. We're doing a phase two study now for adults. We ran into a funding problem uh, for because we lost uh, the source of microbiota. So we're trying to raise uh, money right now so that our collaborators at University of Minnesota can make another batch of microbiota for us. So we've raised over 40,000. We need about 200,000 to complete our study for adults. If that study goes well, uh, then we could go ahead and do a phase three study. A phase three study requires probably of order 500 people, probably about 10 to 20 sites around the country, around the world, and probably cost about $100 million. So if we can raise $100 million, we could probably have that study done in a couple of years and apply for FDA approval a couple years after the, the phase two study. Um, it typically costs a billion dollars to bring a new drug to market. We're far ahead of that with FMT because there's so much human evidence of safety. It seems to be very, very safe. And so far we seem to be getting very high uh, response rates. So very high improvement rates in GI and autism symptoms. So we're very hopeful. Uh, but again, the time frame at best is probably three to four years if we're able to really uh, attract high amounts of investment. And this new study I mentioned that just came out uh, you know, a couple of days ago just helps reinforce how important this area is and how hopeful we are that this could really help greatly reduce, I won't say cure, but I'll say greatly reduce uh, autism and GI symptoms. This kind of goes along that same um, route, but when are you hoping to do another study with children with autism? <laughs> um, as soon as we get additional funding. So we've, um, we will be 
we've already created a GoFundMe page for, um, for our adult study. Once we are able to finish funding for that, we'll also issue a GoFundMe page for a, a child study. We are speaking with a few wealthy donors and we'll see if anything comes of that. If we could get funding for a, another child study, that would be fantastic. And we've submitted the application to the FDA. Um, we've had some initial discussions with them for doing another um, child study. And so we think in a soon as two or three months, we'd be ready to go uh, if all goes well with the FDA, um, which I have high hopes for um, because our first study went so well. Um, and so in a few months, we could do that. It's really just a question of raising the money. We need to raise about, in order to have a statistically significant study, we need to have about 50 participants and we estimate the cost for that would be about $800,000. Now, Making donations to GoFundMe is great. You get it's tax deductible, but instead, if someone wants to invest, then uh, the company we work with, Finch, someone wanted to uh, invest, uh, purchase part of Finch for ten top, for ten million dollars. It's about what we need to do a child study. Um, so again, donating money to us, investing in Finch, uh, either would be very pleased about. All right, getting back to the science. What are the risks when donors are of different ages than the individual receiving the transplant? It's a great question. Um, in general, uh, infants have a very different microbiome, um, especially when they're breastfeeding, then mother's milk has a very special sugar in it, so that almost all of your bacteria is just one type, the infantis. Um, but then at, shortly after that, as the child switches to solid foods, they begin developing a more adult-like microbiome, and after a few years, it's pretty similar to that of adults. It's pretty similar to what they'll have for the rest of their life, um, but somewhat lower diversity. So as they get older, uh, the diversity seems to go up a little bit. Um, so in our study, we, our healthy donors were adults, and we were giving that to children as young as ages 7 to 16. And it seemed very safe and very effective. Would a child donation have been slightly better? Perhaps, but again, it's probably hard to find those children. And we, because they're at younger ages, we know much less about what GI problems they might have cropping up uh, later on in life. So we think that the adult microbiome, because it's more diverse, if it's from people on healthy diets and have high diversity, we think those are probably the best um, types of donors to use. Um, but it's something we'll continue to investigate. There have been studies on personality and gut microbiome. Is that a concern that donor recipients can essentially take on their donor's personality traits? It's actually the opposite type of problem. That's again why we screen for um, mental health conditions as well, looking for those. That um, there have been several mouse studies showing that you can transfer symptoms of depression or other psychiatric disorders into mice from the gut bacteria. Conversely, that's very important. That means that maybe gut bacteria treatments may be helpful for a wide range of psychiatric conditions. We know, for example, with people uh, developing um, Parkinson's disease, um, they may have GI symptoms 20 years before the Parkinson's symptoms develop. So I was, a, I was at a conference in Europe talking with other researchers who are looking at connections of the gut microbiome to a wide range of psychiatric uh, disorders, uh, MS and others. And we think there's a, a strong connection in many of these cases. And that might be why uh, treatments for these conditions have often not been very effective because perhaps they're targeting the wrong thing. Maybe these, many of these brain problems are due to a problem with bad bacteria in the gut releasing neuroactive chemicals into the brain, into the body, that get into the brain and cause problems. And that's what this study two days ago showed that, um, again, identifying what some of these bad metabolites are that are coming from gut bacteria. So um, yes, they, I would be very concerned about getting a gut bacteria transfusion from someone with uh, any other type of mental health problem. Um, chronic fatigue, anxiety, depression. I think all of those might be related to gut bacteria. So you want people not just in good physical health, but people in good mental health as well. 
I believe this question may have been um, answered in the last video, but it's very popular right now in the comments. So I'm going to ask it again. Is there a chance a compassionate care program can open for FMT similar to Duke for stem cells? It's a great question. You have to realize I'm an autism dad. So this, this cuts <laughs> to the heart here. Um, we want to treat everyone we can. We really do. We're doing these studies so we can treat not just a few people in the study, but so we can eventually get FDA approval for millions of people. I know that's several years down the road. I know it's frustrating because we've had hundreds of people asked to be in our next child study, and, and we'll be struggling to raise money for even 50 people for that, I think. Um, so what about compassionate care? So we've looked into the rules on this, and I'm just continuing to look into the rules on this in general. It's usually only allowed for life-threatening conditions, usually. Now, what about the study at Duke? I've been told that Duke has a compassionate care program. I sent an email to the people running that. I'm waiting to hear back from them to find out how they got approval. I don't know. Um, the problem is that we do know even if we try to implement that program, it's going to require us to again submit an IND to the FDA, which I'm very willing to do, but it also requires us to monitor those individuals. So I'm not sure that the cost will be much lower than the cost of what we're presently doing. The FDA may also feel that it's premature, that again, we've done one child study, we're doing one adult study. And so the FDA may well feel that it's premature and why not wait a few years when people have a lifelong condition like autism that's not going to kill you right away. You'll just have those symptoms for many years. So what if you wait another two or three years in, in, to a time when we'll know more and better know what the risks are? So that may be part of what the FDA would think if we were to talk to them about that. So we've had a number of requests about this. I'm trying to learn more about it. I read the FDA guidelines on it. It didn't look like we would qualify because autism, the GI problems are generally not life-threatening. Uh, but we're trying to learn more from uh, researchers at Duke as to how they implemented their program, and we'll see what could be done. Um, but again, for the moment, we're uh, definitely staying with what we know, which is the um, uh, working on our uh, phase two trials, which I think is the most hope to get it um, not only FDA approved, once it's FDA approved, then would also be covered by insurance, we think, in most cases. So that's our hope. Uh, we are just about out of time, so I think that's going to have to wrap it up for now. But if anyone has any more questions, we can always keep collecting them. All right. So I want to thank you all very much for, your, um, for listening. And if you want more information about our research studies, go to our ASU page. That's autism.asu.edu. If you want to learn more about our recommendations for families, we have a lot of information for families on my personal website, adamsautismresearch.com. And then if you want to learn about our special nutritional protocol and a vitamin mineral supplement, you can go to autism. N for nutrition, R for research, C for center.org. And again, I want to thank the many different uh, parent groups who are helping get this Facebook out to families and who have been so supportive with the fundraising. Again, just forwarding on the GoFundMe page. If everyone gave $10 of all the people who've seen it, we'd be ready to be starting our, our child study by then. So thank you all very much for your help and for your patience, and have a great day.